Hey guys, welcome again to Piano Shack with me, Woody. In this episode, I'm going to give you the grand tour of the Piano Shack. Yes, I'm going to show you my current collection of synthesizers. There's quite a lot of them, so this might be a long video. We're also going to discuss some of the synths that came and went during 2016, and I'll share with you some of my plans for 2017. And also at the end, I'm going to reveal a new synthesizer to you. Yes, over here in this bag over here, we have a new synthesizer that I'm very excited to show you later on today. So stick around, this is going to be fun. Let's get on with the show. Okay, so as you can see, uh, many of my synths are just here hiding in the corner and gathering a lot of dust. It's a bit of a shame. Yeah, I hate to see synthesizers like this uh, all in a corner, but the thing is I don't have space to have them set up all of the time. So what I tend to do is just drag one out when I want to do a video about it or make a track and then I'll put it back again when I'm done. So we'll start with this one here, which is of course the red one. Yeah, this is my Nord Lead A1. Let's zoom in a little bit on that for you. So as you may know, I have a soft spot for these Nord Lead synthesizers. They're probably my favorite synths of all time. I've owned several, including the Nord Lead 2, the 2X in rack format and in keyboard format. And this is the latest incarnation, which is the Nord Lead A1. And Nord have changed the formula quite a bit for the sound engine on this thing. I think it sounds uh, very, very nice, very rich and analog, but they've certainly made some quite drastic changes to the control layout, which I'm curious to investigate. Actually, we've done quite a lot of tutorial videos or kind of tech demos on this instrument already, and I'm in the process of uploading them to the channel. So the next one here, I'm not sure what it is. Let's take a look. Yeah, okay. What we have here, is one of my personal favorites at the moment. It is, of course, there we go. My Yamaha DX7, the original DX7 from 1983. So the funny thing about this synthesizer is that I hated the sounds of the DX7 for like the last 20 years or so. I really didn't like those electric piano sounds and bell sounds and whatever. But then in the last five years, I don't know, I've become quite attached to the sound of the DX7. I've been hearing it a lot in the synthwave tunes that I like to listen to. And there's no doubt about it. This is an iconic instrument. Um, it's a beautiful instrument even today. It sounds pretty fat and has a lot of impact and punch in the sounds, which I like a lot. Uh, not to mention the build quality of this thing is absolutely phenomenal. It really is built like a tank. It's completely metal construction and the action on this is wonderful to play. I've done quite a few videos on the DX7 now. Um, let's see, we did a preset walkthrough which has proved to be really, really popular. I'm getting a ton of views on those videos where I did like a presentation of the 32 factory presets on the instrument. So all in all, a very, very cool synthesizer. And this one is in nice condition for an instrument that is almost 35 years old right now. Let's move on to the next one. Yep, next in the lineup here then, we have a, another embarrassingly dusty classic from the 80s. It is my Roland D50. Now, when I bought it, there was all sorts of Velcro self-adhesive sticky pads stuck all over this thing. And I was a bit worried about getting them off without damaging the surface. But as you can see, that turned out not to be a problem, although it was quite time consuming to get them off. And now we have a pretty much immaculate mint Roland D50. Now this synthesizer has some truly iconic sounds that sound still really, really rather wonderful today. And I did a walkthrough of my favorite presets on the instrument in a sort of two part series. And that video has been getting me a ton of views and people are really liking it. So thank you very much for that. I've also performed a number of tracks with this keyboard, but I want to do a lot more. One of my viewers sent me a sound bank with some more synthetic and sort of atmospheric cinematic sounds and I really want to do some kind of ambient music with this instrument. And finally in this corner then we have one more classic Yamaha synthesizer from the 80s. And I think, oh it's tangled up in my guitars. Let's, let's do that. 
I think most of you have seen this on my channel. There we go. It is, of course, the rather handsome Yamaha DX7 Mark II. This is the DX7S model. Let me zoom in a bit for you. So this synthesizer has pretty much exactly the same FM, frequency modulation, synthesis, sound engine, as its earlier brother, the original Yamaha DX7. But there are a number of differences. We have better buttons here. We have real clicky buttons instead of these ZX81 membrane buttons. And we have a backlit display. There's a few more sliders here that you can assign things to. And there's a performance mode, which is pretty rubbish. You might think in a performance mode, you can layer together different sounds. But on this particular model, you can't. It just allows you to set some tuning and assign the foot pedal to different things. It's pretty much a waste of time. The build quality is once again excellent on this one, though perhaps not quite as solid as the DX7 behind it. Um, and all of these keyboards have fantastic actions. The keyboard action itself is a true joy to play on all of these. The D50 also is absolutely fabulous in that respect. So when I bought this one, which was about a week after the DX7, both of them came up in a very short space of time. And I've been waiting for maybe half a year to find one at all, and then two came at the same time. Actually, the D50 was just a couple of weeks apart as well. And this one came in pretty much the same week as well. When I bought this one, I wanted to compare the two, the DX7 and the DX7S, and keep the one that I like the most, because these are very similar keyboards and there's no need really to have two. But I'm still trying to choose between them. I really am not sure. I think I'm leaning towards the DX7 because it's got that funky look and just the build quality of it is absolutely amazing. Whilst we're here, why don't I show you my guitar collection, which is also something that I want to feature a little bit more of in 2017. Yuck, just look at the grime and the grunk and the dust down here. It's pretty gross. Anyway, I haven't played my guitar since I started the channel. Um, up until I started my channel a year ago, I was quite into the guitars and not playing keyboards at all. But then I switched focus when I decided to start my own YouTube channel. I'm actually a better keyboard player than I am a guitar player. In, in, in the guitar world, I'm kind of just a bluffer. So we have a very cheap but rather nice Fender acoustic guitar. This one cost me about $100 or something. And it's kind of in tune. I mean, I don't know how anybody can make a guitar for a hundred bucks. Yes, brand new. This one cost me a hundred. I can't see the model. I think it's a Fender CD60 or something. Okay, I will leave it at that for that one. Let's keep the plectrum. Now then we have an interesting electric here that is absolutely caked in dust Ooh, oh my gosh would you look at that look at that Ugh, it's gross anyway so what is this one this is my i forget what is it it's a squire stratocaster kind of it might not be so obvious but it's a stratocaster body a stratocaster neck and this, I think, is the Squire 50s. What do they call them? Uh, let me think for a second. Custom Vibe? Classic Vibe? Squire, Squire 50s Classic Vibe Strat, I think it's called. Let me get rid of some of the dust here. As you can probably see, if you know anything about guitars, this one is highly modified by myself. So when you buy these things new, it has three pickups, just like most Fender Stratocasters have. And you get a toggle switch down here where you can switch between the three pickups or have the sort of two in-between positions, so five different positions in total. And then there's two or is it three, I think probably three knobs for the tone and the volume. But that was far too fiddly and complicated for me. And at the time I was playing quite a lot of rock, uh, the ACDC stuff and things like that, slightly uh, heavier tone than what you get from a Stratocaster. So I thought about buying myself a Les Paul or perhaps one of those Gibson guitars, 
but I like the shape of the Fender Strat body quite a lot. And this is a beautiful playing light instrument. So what I decided to do was to change out the pick guard uh, to one that just had this uh, single humbucker position. And I mounted a new pickup there. I don't remember exactly what this one is, but it's a very, very hot uh, output, high gain pickup that sounds really, really cool for rock. Uh, and I simplified, of course, the knobs and the controls because you don't need very much with a single pickup. So I've just got a volume control here in black and a tone control in white. And this instrument is still holding its tune. That's pretty good. One day I'm going to do a demo of this one. I'll plug it into my amplifier and you can have a good listen. But this was a fun project. I enjoy tinkering with electronics and stuff and you don't really get the chance to do that with your synthesizers. But on, on the guitar world, you can do whatever you like and it's great fun. So poking around in here is a bit like a time capsule of dust, grime and old unused instruments. It's a real shame that I haven't been playing my guitars very much. We have my guitar amp down here which is a Roland Cube 30X. This is a really really nice modeling amplifier. You have all of your different preset sounds on it to emulate old Fenders and Vox amps and that kind of thing. Sounds really really nice. This is what I normally play my electric guitar through. Okay I also have a pretty unusual and unique bass guitar. Uh, you don't know this but I was really into bass guitar about 10-15 years ago. I, I played hard studied hard for five years, got my chops together and played in both a rock band and a jazz band as a bass player. And this is the instrument I used. This is a court performer series. It's a pretty good looking guitar, I think. Uh, these ones are a little bit weird because I don't think the body is made of wood. It's made of some synthetic plastic resin compound, which is a little bit strange, but it sounds good and it's kind of quite lightweight and comfortable to play. Um, anyway, when I bought this one, it had, well, it was a jazz bass configuration. So you had two pickups and three knobs to switch between the, the balance of the two pickups, if I remember rightly. This was a long time ago, but that was all too complicated for me. And I was really into the sound of the P bass, the Fender Precision bass at that time. I wanted that sound. So what I've done I've installed pickups from an American standard uh, P bass that I got from eBay or somewhere. The original neck, sorry, the original bridge pickup that was sitting there, I've blanked off with this. Oh shit, I'm banging my D50. I blanked off with this sticker. That's just there for looks. These lies and lips and stuff are covering up where the knobs were originally located because I've wired this one up so that the output from the pickups goes straight to the jack. It seemed to me that all the uh, controls I needed were on the amplifier anyway, available on the amplifier, so I didn't really need to duplicate them on the bass. That was my thinking at the time. And I wanted to keep everything nice and simple and clean on the bass. So there you go. This is my Court Performer Series bass. And I haven't used this one for many, many years. And in the case here, which seems to be broken. Uh, force it open. There we go. Let's do it that way. So inside here is a case I donated to my son about three or four years ago, and I think he's forgotten about it. This is a guitar I bought back in England ooh, 20, 25 years ago. There's something inside and I don't know what it is. Probably a plectrum, I guess. But this is a sort of flamenco Spanish guitar, which is horribly out of tune. But this thing's got some sentimental value for me. I bought this when I was maybe 18, 19 years old, my first serious guitar that I bought. It's not an expensive guitar. It's probably in the $200 price range. And there's some splitting of the wood going on here, which is a little bit scary, both here. And I think I noticed around the bridge as well, but it's a pretty nice guitar. Hopefully my son will be inspired to 
play either the guitar here or the keyboards. Oh, it's getting hot in here. So anyway, in the middle of the room where we have the fireplace over here, which is switched off at the moment. Well, switched off, it's an analog <laughs> fireplace, so I haven't lit it. Uh, it's hot enough as it is. Uh, over here in the middle, I have my PSR S970 keyboard, which has been a bit of a smash hit on my channel. I think many, many of my views have come from my unboxing and demos of the PSR S970, which is a bit surprising. Who would have thought that these instruments were so popular? But there seems to be a bit of a interest in these arranger style keyboards. Let me bring the camera a bit closer for you. So this isn't really a synthesizer per se, but it's got thousands of really, really great sounds that are taken from the Motif series of synthesizer workstations. Uh, so you've got a bunch of really great sounds here. You can edit them to some extent, but the thing is you get loads and loads of rhythms and things built in as well that you can just use to accompany yourself and jam along with. It's great fun. And I've done a whole bunch of demo videos on my channel of this instrument, which are getting me a lot of views. They're getting me a lot of comments and also quite a lot of <laughs> dislikes because I tend to goof around a bit when I'm playing this keyboard and some people maybe think that I should be taking it more seriously or I don't know. But uh, there's a bit of a like-dislike thing going on with my PSR 970 videos. Uh, I like it because it's nice to have one instrument in the house that you can just press a button, power on and play. It's got loudspeakers built in. They sound pretty good. They certainly fill up the room with volume. Uh, let me play one little style for you, shall I? Let me go to the R&B section. We'll take the very first one and I'll play something for you. Again, this is a rather dusty keyboard. I haven't used it very much in the last few months. In fact, I've been out of town for quite a while. Let's see. So with these arranger keyboards, you basically play a chord with your left hand and the instrument does the rest. was my PSR. I have done a lot of videos on this one and I plan to do more. I'm going to do some more tutorials on the different chord modes because there are several different ways you can play these left hand patterns that I'm still experimenting with but I think it's worth its own video. I also did some videos showing how you connect external screens to this one and as I say they've been really popular driving a lot of views to the channel. It's hard to know sometimes which videos will be popular. Right, as you might be able to see, we have a keyboard sort of tucked away underneath here as well. So let's pull that one out so you can have a look. Now then, you might be asking yourself why I've hidden my keyboard underneath like this, where it's kind of completely unplayable. I put it there because there's some protection from my kid and his friends who like to come in this room and throw toys around and balls and fly radio control gadgets and uh, helicopters and things. And I thought that corner there would offer it some protection. So what do we have here then? This is my one and only analog synthesizer. Yeah, this is a real analog mono synth from Moog. Yes, the legendary Moog Corporation. And I was really stoked when I picked this one up. You should go back and check out my pickup video if you haven't already seen it. I think it was one of my mystery synth pickup videos. But I've already done some videos on this one. I've done some classical compositions, some arrangements of classical songs in the style of like Wendy Carlos from the 70s. We've done some Bach and I've got some 
Paca Bell, I think it is coming up. Um, I'm going to do Jisoo Joy. But I also did Popcorn, which is one of these quirky synthesizer tunes from the 70s. And uh, that one is, uh, I'm really quite proud how that one turned out. It sounds great. Uh, there is a certain special magic to the sound of the Moog, no doubt about it. When I record this one into my computer and listen to the results, it does have a certain element to the sound that you can't really capture on any digital emulation um, or software version of the instrument. It does sound rather special. So I do have lots of plans for this one in 2017. I mentioned when I was showing you my Nord Lead that I wanted to compare it against another synthesizer, and this is the one I had in mind. Uh, this is a real analog synthesizer. The Nord Lead is a virtual analog synthesizer that attempts with some digital processing to get the same sound as the analog synthesizers. And I want to put them sort of head to head against each other and have a listen to them both. I'll dial in a sort of regular sawtooth sound with some filters and envelopes on this one, nothing too advanced, and we'll recreate exactly the same sound on the Nord and listen to them one after the other and see if we can hear any of this analog magic. Is this one fatter? Does it have more warmth than the Nord? I intend to find out, so I think you'll enjoy that. So that's what we have in the middle here. Let's go into my study, the computer room. I don't know exactly what we call that room. That's the room where I edit all my videos and I've got my software and there's also a bunch of keyboards in there as well. So come on, let's go. Before we do that, I want to talk about some of the synthesizers that came and went during the previous year. To start with, I had a Roland FA-08. Do you remember those videos? I actually bought that synthesizer specifically with the purpose of starting a YouTube channel. At the beginning of, beginning of 2016, I didn't have any keyboards at all. And I wanted to have a channel. I wanted to demonstrate and review something, so I picked up a used Roland FA-08. In fact, all the equipment you see here beside me, obviously these old ones, but everything I have bought uh, used because I like to buy stuff, demonstrate it on the channel, and then I'll offload it to somebody else and get some new gear in so we can keep rotating new instruments to keep it interesting for myself and for you. I then picked up a rather battered uh, but cheap Nord Electro 2, which I revealed to you guys as being my favorite keyboard of all time which is completely true. It really is my favorite. I did a bunch of videos on it because I wanted to pay tribute to the Nord Electro 2. And some guys were asking on my channel as a comment, oh, well, what's the point in reviewing the old model? And I really wanted to prove that even the older keyboards can still sound fabulous today. And you might not necessarily need the Nord Lead, or sorry, the Nord Electro 5 that's gonna cost you $2,000 when you can have for $300 the Nord Electro 2, which still for me, ticks all the boxes. And I also showed you a homemade dual manual Hammond organ style cabinet that I built for the Electro that uh, was really cool. That had been in my loft for 15 years. I dug it out, did a video, and then eventually sold the whole rig to a music student, prog rocker that was also a female. There are not enough female prog rocker keyboard players in this world. So I was very, very pleased to sell their keyboard onto her at a good price. Again, I feel it's going to a good home. I also borrowed a couple of keyboards during 2016. I swapped my FA for a while with uh, a friend who loaned me his, uh, what was it? A Yamaha Motif XF. 7 was the model, so I was able to do some videos of that one as well. And we even did a shootout at his place where we connected both of them up to a digital rec recorder, and I played riffs on both keyboards in a variety of different styles and with different presets. And again, that video has got me a ton of views. You guys either hated it or, or loved it. Um, uh, but anyway, that one created a lot of engagement. There's hundreds and hundreds of comments on that one with people voicing their opinions on what they think is best and how badly I did the demo. But it was just a bit of fun and uh, go, go watch it if you haven't already seen it. Also, another friend, Anders, loaned me his Nord Stage 2, which was really exciting. I've never played that keyboard before, so we had one here in the shack for a couple of months, and I did a bunch of demos on that one as well. So again, if you haven't seen it, go check those out. 
We also had a MC303 Roland Groovebox for a little while. Uh, this was a nostalgic thing for me. I'd seen one in Australia when I was traveling around the world in like 96 when it came out. I loved it and I was curious to see how well it had stood the test of time. So we bought one of those used. Uh, I went out in the garden and we did quite a nice demo. And I think that's pretty much what we did. That's the synthesizers that I uh, had to offload to uh, make space for new ones during 2016. So here we are in the computer room slash studio slash office slash whatever you want to call it. We're not sure. It's a multi-purpose room, but it's here I spend all the time when I'm editing the videos, which I will eventually upload to YouTube. It's also where I compose and produce a lot of the tracks that you hear on the channel. And I tend to connect my synthesizers into the sound card of the PC that's hidden underneath the desk here. Also, when I want to capture the audio from those old instruments. So while we're here, let me show you some of my favorite virtual software synthesizers and some that I'll be featuring in the year ahead. I'll just reposition the camera so it's focused on the screen. All right, so the DAW or digital audio workstation I'm using these days is Reaper, which I absolutely love. I used to be a Pro Tools user, but then I switched to Reaper about five years ago and have never looked back. This thing is fantastic. Also, I have my Roland A49 keyboard here on the desk in front of me. By now, you've probably already seen my review of this one. Uh, if not, it will be coming shortly. Right, so within Reaper here, I am going to show you some of the instruments we featured during the last year. There is Piano Tech Stage. Let me start recording as well so that we can capture the audio as I'm playing it slightly better quality than what we're going to get through the speakers. So Piano Tech is a piano emulation, a virtual piano. Absolutely fabulous. I love this. Okay, I won't play too much now. I'm just going to flash through these quite quickly, but I have done some piano shootouts of Piano Tech compared to its competitor in the virtual piano world, which is has expired, but this is true pianos. And even though it's expired, you can still play it, which is nice. Then we have, of course, the best free VST ever, or the best two. I don't know which is the best of these two. Let's start with synth one which is a analog synthesizer software synth. Where did it go? Come back again. There we are. Which is loosely modeled on the Prophet 5 and the Nord Lead synthesizers, I think. Okay, Dex Ed. Yes, this is something we featured extensively on the channel. I've done tutorials of this one and I've done a comparison of Dex Ed against my DX7 because this is a DX7 editor and emulation. I think it does a great job. Uh, let's just fire up some random patch. So moving on then, uh, let's synth one Dex Ed. I have this one. Now this is something we are going to feature a lot in the coming months. This is a Korg M1 Legacy Edition. This is Korg's own VST version of their M1 synthesizer. Green pad. Mm -hmm. 
So there we go. What I need to do is get myself a Korg M1 synthesizer to complete my collection of 80s digital synths. I mean, the D50, the DX7, and the M1. Those three were massive synthesizers in the 80s. The M1, as you probably know, is the best-selling synthesizer of all time. I need to get one of those, and then what we're going to do is do another one of my head-to-head -head comparisons between the real synthesizer and the software emulation. I've got a feeling they're going to be very close. There's no reason why they shouldn't be identical, but uh, let's find out as soon as I get myself a Korg M1. So that is my main priority for the beginning of 2017. Okay, uh, over here in the corner then, underneath my headphones, and the microphone boom for another synthesizer you've seen me playing in recent months. Well, we have my Electribe, which I bought about a, let's put it like that, which I bought about a year ago. So there we go, that's the Korg Electribe, a fantastic machine, very, very easy to create great sounding grooves and compositions using this one. Uh, it's portable as well and really nice quality, well-built, good sounding instruments. Okay, finally, we're getting towards the end of the tour. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, behind me here in the corner, I have a couple more synthesizers that I'm gonna show you now. So you've seen a lot of this instrument in the last couple of months. I've done quite a few videos on this. Let's reposition the camera. Yep, this is of course my JDXI, which I picked up two or three months ago. Again, uh, used at a pretty nice price. Uh, I've put tape on there in case you're wondering and sort of written the, the function of each button because by default it's not very easy to read them. You can see there it's very small text and kind of red on shiny black. But with this little hack, this little mod, I can easily see what the controls are. There aren't many controls, it's a very easy synth to use. And I've really been enjoying this one. I've had a great time with this one, it's a blast because it is so easy to build up a short song, a little composition. You've got four different tracks, two digital synthesizer tracks, a drum track, and then an analog track. And so it's quite limited, but sometimes limitations are nice and I've been able to create some quite nice compositions with this. So if you're curious to hear more of this synthesizer, Take a look at my back catalogue and you can see lots of demos of this one. Okay, I guess this is going to be a long video because I've just noticed the batteries on my secondary camera there have just died. So for the time being, let's press on without it. So finally, hiding behind here, if you haven't figured out, it's my... Let's pull this one out. A quite heavy key lab. 49, the Arturia key lab 49. Let's reposition things here so you can see it. So this is probably the only bad experience I've had buying gear in 2016. I bought this one uh, from a guy in Stockholm. I got home, plugged it into the computer and found out that the USB port on the back was very loose and wobbly. It wasn't making a good contact at all. If you juggled the cable a little bit, the keyboard would reboot and repower. There's obviously a bad contact there in the USB. So I was a bit disappointed, uh, but anyway, I decided it would be quite an interesting video to tear this thing apart and fix the USB socket. I actually soldered on a new one onto the PCB, which worked out really good. And it works perfectly now. But as I was doing that repair, uh, I bumped one of the keys and it popped up. It fell out of place, it broke, it snapped off. Uh, which was featured in the video. And um, well, it turns out that a ton of other Arturia Keylab owners have had exactly the same problem. On my keyboard, it was the middle C that had popped up. Um, but anyway, I was disappointed, of course, but I decided to fix it on the video. So with a bit of glue, we actually did a repair of that one. And now, yes, it is time to reveal what we have inside this oversized black keyboard case. That wasn't easy. Okay, now, here we go. This is an 88 key piano case, but the thing inside is only 61. There's my first clue. Uh, okay, here we go, guys. Are you ready? Here's the reveal. OMG. So I got a phone call from the missus exactly as I was about to unveil this to you. Isn't that typical? How do they know that you can call at the most inconvenient time? Anyway, let's do it one more time. Here is the big reveal of my new keyboard. Take a look at this. 
Yes, it is, of course. The Korg M1, I've been teasing you a little bit. I know I've been telling you during this video that this is my highest priority to get the M1 in so I can do some comparisons with the software and do some nice demos of the fabulous presets on this thing. And I had one all along, but I picked this up like six hours ago. So I still haven't really got used to the idea that I own an M1. It's just been sitting in, in the case here. I haven't actually even tried it out. So there you go, that was the first keyboard acquisition of 2017, and I think it's a really good one. It now completes my trio of iconic synthesizers, digital synthesizers of the 1980s. So there you go, that's all for today. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I'll see you again real soon. Cheerio. Woody Piano Shack.